I've been tasked with presenting some common mistakes, tips, tricks on rectal cancer contouring. I've included a couple cases today in the, in the preoperative setting, one in the postoperative setting. So here's what, here's what I hope to cover in this about 50, 55 minute session. As part of some introductory materials, we'll cover the targets that are important to cover when, when planning a case for rectal cancer. We'll review some of the classic fields using bony anatomy. I know 10 years ago, when I first entered the field of radiation oncology, we planned almost entirely using, using 2D landmarks for our, for our fields. So we'll review those as kind of a, a history and an explanation of the 3D volume definitions for 3D planning that we're, we're using a little bit more liberally now. And then the majority of this session will be spent in cases one, two, and three. You can see them here, and I'll give you a little bit more information about these patients when we get there. So just to kind of introduce the topic and, and help me understand a little bit more about how y'all treat rectal cancer in your practice, we have this icebreaker question. And so we can open the poll if you can help me with that. How do you usually treat rectal cancer? You know, do you usually give preoperative radiation, postoperative radiation, or is it, you know, a fair mix of both? We could probably close right. it, huh? 75%. I will close it. There we go. Uh, awesome. So the results, it looks like just over half of y'all treat with preoperative radiation before surgery, 18% routinely give postoperative radiation, and then 29%, a little under a third, will you know kind of use a mixture of a both, beside deciding between both options. So you know, for those of you treating predominantly with preoperative radiation for rectal cancer, that's that's the majority of my practice. The vast majority of my practice actually is also with preoperative radiation. At our center, we have a pretty robust multidisciplinary group where we'll bring patients' cases to the tumor board before they start any therapy. The surgeons will present their case. We'll look at their MRI and other imaging together. And as a group of surgeons, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists decide on what, if any, preoperative treatment is needed before surgery. And our colorectal surgeons are a great and collaborative bunch, and they, they really value the role of preoperative radiation. And, you know, I, I should have put a follow-up poll question here. Often our tumor board discussions are not as much talking about pre-op versus post-op, but what flavor and combination of preoperative therapy are we going to be using? Is it going to be short course, long course, TNT, you know, chemo first, chemo second? So a lot of personalization going on in that arena. I actually had to dig back in my case archives looking for a post-operative case to share with you guys today. I think in the last seven years of my practice, I've treated two cases of, of post-operative radiation for rectal cancer. So hopefully we can have a good discussion on, on post-operative practices. I'll show you how, how I do it, how we do it here, and some of the, the principles that we follow, but would love to hear your experience on that as well. It's admittedly, it's not a big part of my practice. Okay, so let's get into some of the introductory materials. So in terms of rectal cancer, obviously we want to make sure that the tumor itself is well covered when we're, when we're treating somebody in the preoperative setting. Obviously, we want to make sure we've got generous coverage of any involved lymph nodes. And the elective nodal coverage is also a big component. You know, the majority of time spent in, in target delineation for me now is in outlining the elective nodal volumes. So, you know, we want to look at the areas that are primary drainage, primary echelon nodal drainage for rectal cancer. They include the mesorectum and the presacral area. We can also, you know, we also will cover the lateral pelvic lymph nodes for, for all patients with rectal cancer to include the nodal basins around the obturator and the internal iliac vessels. We also have special situations where we'll extend the elective nodal coverage to cover the external iliac nodal basin if there's T4B disease with tumor invading into those anterior organs. And I'll admit this is a little bit of a controversial subject, but we'll also consider adding inguinal nodal coverage for very low-lying rectal tumors that invade, invade into the anal canal. So you know, kind of a, a step back in time, or not not really, this is a, a contemporary case of a, a patient I treated with a 3D technique. You know, we 
I, I will almost, almost entirely start with a 3D plan when I'm planning radiation for a patient in the preoperative setting for rectal cancer. So unless there are extenuating circumstances, you know, a, a really large amount of bowel in the field, maybe in a man who's had a prior prostatectomy or a woman that's had a prior hysterectomy, unless there's really a special reason for it, I will almost exclusively use 3D conformal radiation with a PA beam and two laterals for the initial prescription of 45 gray and 25 fractions. These are the classic field borders for the PA beam and the lateral beams. Start at about the border of L5S1, go down to the bottom of the obturator foramen or three centimeters below GTV. The lateral borders go two centimeters from the pelvic inlet here. And then we can place some corner blocks to block out the femoral head and maybe a little bit of bowel tissue superiorly. In terms of the laterals, classically, the posterior block goes one centimeter behind the sacrum. That allows for you know, full dose buildup in the nodes that hug the anterior border of the sacral bones. And the anterior border, we, we place that field edge about three centimeters in front of the sacral promontory with some corner blocks to, to block out some of the soft tissue here and some of the soft tissue in the perineum, as well as an anterior block for, for balance and for bladder. So, you know, when I first started in radiation oncology, anytime we had a patient we were treating in the preoperative setting for rectal cancer, we would, the only contour we would place would be the GTV. So we contour the GTV, turn it on, on the DRRs like I have here, we'd set the borders and blocks and, and we'd call it a day. Since then, we've really involved, oh, sorry. So, so that was the, the 45 gray and 25 gray volume. For us, when we would plan the boosts, usually, you know, the, to bring the total to the tumor bed plus margin or the tumor plus margin up to 50.4 gray, we would copy the opposed lateral fields, bring down that superior margin to touch two centimeters from the GTV and bring in the anterior margin to touch two centimeters from the GTV. So we would not only boost the tumor itself, but also the entire mesorectum at the level of the GTV plus margin and the entire presacral space. And I'll admit, you know, this is a place where reasonable radiation oncologists can disagree. Some folks will just do a tumor plus margin boost, and that's very reasonable. The reason we at MD Anderson have always included just a little bit of a larger boost volume when treating 3D is because of this patterns of study, patterns of failure study we did that showed the vast majority of recurrences are going to be in the, the low pelvis, but also this presacral area. So including a little bit more of a generous volume in the boost there has become our institutional practice when we're treating with 3D. So in the, in the last 10 years, since I came to MD Anderson, we've moved more towards 3D planning. That doesn't mean we do IMRT for all of our pre-op rectal cancer cases, but what we will do is we will be very purposeful about delineating our target volumes. So we won't just use those bony landmarks and set the field borders and set the blocks, but we'll outline the GTV, we'll outline the CTV that includes all of the, the nodal areas, put on a PTV margin, and then set our blocks kind of in a little bit more of a, a personalized manner and ensure that we've covered what we set out to cover. So in, in moving to this practice, you know, we, we will utilize, and I'll point our trainees and our residents to utilize these published contouring atlases. I think you guys saw this in, in advance of today's session. There are some minor definitions between this RTOG atlas and the, the European atlas in reference number two, but by and large, the, the definitions and the volumes look very similar. And I'll, I'll point out some of those nuances and differences as we go along. So before I dive into case one, any, any questions about classic field borders, approach to rectal cancer and its targets? Okay. Um, all right. So then let's start with case number one. So this is a preoperative case. This is a guy I saw, 47-year-old man. He presented to medical attention with rectal bleeding. He had a workup that included endoscopy that showed a four centimeter mass, five centimeters from the anal verge. There was a biopsy that showed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. It was microsatellite stable. He went on to get a staging MRI to get the T staging and the N staging for his cancer. And it showed here on this axial slice, you can see the thickening here on the right anterior lateral aspect of the rectum. 
non-circumferential tumor. There was some threatening of the circumferential resection margin here anteriorly. The tumor protruding through the rectal wall was about 1.3 millimeters from that mesorectal fascia. There was no EMVI and there weren't any suspicious lymph nodes on, on the MRI. So we discussed him in our multidisciplinary tumor board. The patient uh, was met with a colorectal surgeon who told them that they were, you know, possibly there's possibilities for sphincter preservation surgery, but it was, you know, it was likely that they, they very well might need an APR to, to clear the tumor. The patient was really hoping not to have a permanent end colostomy, had read about the opera trial and the work going on at MSK and was hoping for an organ preservation approach. So to best facilitate that, what we planned for him was total neoadjuvant therapy. And we started that with some upfront long course chemo radiation. The plan was to follow that with consolidative chemotherapy per the opera trial. And so what I planned for him was initial treatment, 45 gray and 25 fractions using a PA and right and left laterals like we discussed up front. And then I elected to give him a slightly higher dose boost of nine gray in five additional fractions. That was allowed on the opera protocol for folks interested in organ preservation. So a little bit of a, a controversial topic, a little bit of you know style points there. Obviously, boosting to 50.4 would have been okay as well. So before I get into his case and his contours, I have our first Zoom poll here. And the question is, for locally advanced rectal cancer, how would you contour the inferior extent of the elective nodal CTV? And so what we've got here, this patient is a clinical T3, like the patient I showed you. The pink contour is the GTV. The green contour is the bladder. And then these different colored volumes represent the elective nodal CTV. So essentially we're looking at what inferior extent would you use and how much lateral margin would you use? So look carefully, a couple of them look pretty similar. I'll also tell you that this opaque, radio opaque thing down here is a BB at the anal verge. So Dr. Holliday, while we're waiting for answers to trickle in, if I could ask a question from the chat. Sure. Charity asked if there are any differences with anterior border of lateral field. She saw some references for if you have a greater than T3 disease, you can include the pubic bone for your for that anterior border. I think you can. You know, traditionally we would split the pubic symphysis with the anterior edge of the of the lateral beam. You know, if you have T4B disease and the external iliac nodes are at risk, you're going to need a more generous anterior field border in order to encompass those. You also end up with a lot more bladder dose when you do it that way. You get more of the bladder in those lateral fields. So, you know, in, in the old days, you would cover the pubic bone because that's how you would make sure you were getting generous coverage to the, to the extent of the external iliac nodes. These days, you know, we would include the external iliac nodes in the elective CTV contour, turn that on, and then use that to guide the placement of our anterior block. So, you know, we do the, the, the CT sim, we have the axial slices, you know, that show the area we want to cover. So the idea is kind of blending both approaches. So still doing 3D treatment or, you know, simple 3D treatment delivery, three field delivery, but utilizing the information from the axial CT slices to kind of personalize the field borders. Right. That makes sense. Great question. Thank you so much. Feel free to ask yeah, more. Absolutely. I'll give it five more seconds and then I'm going to actually end this poll. Dr. Holiday, I think you can see the answers. Sure. All right. So actually a pretty even split. So we had 32% choosing A and 26% choosing B, 24% choosing C, and then the least popular answer was D, 18% of y'all chose that one. So let me... Oops, show you here. How do I get rid of this? There we go. So the correct answer as, as it was drawn for this question is A. And I know there are only some, some subtle differences. I think the, you know, the first big difference is between A and C and B and D. How low do you go? 
So if you've got a tumor that's kind of in the, in the mid rectum, mid to high rectum, the point this question is trying to make is that you don't necessarily need to extend your 45 gray volume or your, you know, elective nodal CTB all the way down to the verge. You know, in, in the 2D era, we would set that inferior block edge at the bottom of the obturator foramen or three centimeters below disease, kind of back calculating and applying that in the contouring area. Usually that means you want to give about 1.5 to 2 centimeters from your GTV to your CTV or PTV margin, and then, you know, ask your dosimetrist to, to give you 90, 95% or greater coverage there. So, so that's, that's the, the point we're making here is that you don't necessarily need to cover the whole anal canal plus margin for a mid to high rectal tumor. In the atlases, the contouring atlases will describe the inferior extent of the elective CTV at the pelvic floor. So that's, that's where I'll end it on the axial CP slices. I'll show you that when we get to the case. So then deciding between A and C, if we know we don't want coverage all the way down to the verge, the main difference or the only difference really is the anterior extent of, of CTV here inferiorly. So you do want to make sure you cover the whole mesorectum and, you know, make sure that you've got at least a centimeter around your GTV into any anterior structures. So at this level, the bladder and also the prostate here. So it cuts it just a little bit close at this corner, which is, which is what makes A the correct answer. All right, so essentially that's what's written on this slide, you know, the, and, and I'll describe it when we get to the case, but, you know, the first step in generating your rectal cancer plan is to outline the GTV. You use all the information available to you in terms of, of your own physical exam, endoscopy reports, any axial imaging, and my other tip, and, and something I see trainees sometimes miss out on when they're doing their, their early cases, is you don't want to contour the GTV too narrowly. So you want to make sure you include the whole circumference of the rectum at the involved level so that if there's any day-to-day -day variation of gas, stool, whatever, you don't end up missing your, your GTV coverage. And then in terms of extent, you want at least a centimeter superior and inferior to the GTV. And this may end up pushing your superior border higher if it's a high rectosigmoid tumor, and it may end up pushing your inferior border lower if you're dealing with the low rectal tumor invading into the anal canal. So let's do another quick poll. This time we're looking kind of at the mid pelvis, and we're looking again at the elective CTV for a standard clinical T3 and zero rectal cancer. So again, the GTV is in pink, that, that green structure is the bladder, and the different colors there are the elective nodal CTV. And I know the differences are subtle, so look close. We could always sing it. <laughs> All not, right. Not, not me. <laughs> it's the reason I keep my day job. All right. Okay, so great. So the poll results are in, 14% of y'all chose A, a little over 50% of y'all chose B, C got 28%, and D got 7%. So the, the correct answer as written is B. And again, the, the differences here are subtle, but the main difference between A and B and C and D is that anterior field border. And in the, in the atlases I sent you guys, Meyerson and Valentini both recommend one centimeter of margin into the bladder or prostate or, you know, upper vagina or uterus, whatever the anterior structure is, in order to make sure that you get adequate coverage of that anterior aspect of the mesorectum. So answer choices C and D kind of carve out of the bladder. And so the CTV margin ends up being quite close to the, to the rectal GTV at these slices. I'll admit, you know, the difference between A and B is extending the CT coverage here, you know, kind of into the, into the sacral indentations here into the neuroforamen. There are, you know, some pelvic tumor sites where, where the experts were, will not advocate for that. I know at my own institution, some of the GYN radiation oncologists don't recommend extending the CTV into this space because they feel it throws a little extra dose into the sacrum. And, you know, for the GYN malignancies, maybe the risk of a posterior recurrence isn't as high. My personal style, and I think, you know, the, the atlases will, will be consistent with that, is for rectal cancer and anal cancers to extend posteriorly and include the space. 
The posterior presacral area is a, is a very high risk site for recurrence. It's a part that's the most difficult to clear surgically. So including this area in the 45 gray volume, you know, we, we think it's worth it. So that's why B is the correct answer. I've had a couple of really smart trainees ask me, you know, hey, don't you know the definition of a CTV? You know, a CTV is supposed to be where we think microscopic disease is, is going to extend. So do we really think microscopic disease is extending into the bladder at this level? And the answer is no, you know, we don't for, for kind of a standard clinical T3 tumor. And, and those residents that point that out make a really great point. This is a little bit of a liberal interpretation of, of a CTV. You know, if we were being real purists with the definitions, we might call this an ITV instead, because what we're really doing is we're adjusting the CTV border to ensure coverage of the GTV, even if there's some day-to-day -day changes in either bladder filling or rectal distension with, with gas or stool. So for this question, B is the correct answer. Okay, so just you know, brief review of mesorectal anatomy. I know you guys had access to these atlases before this session, but the, the MRI has really helped with our planning and our identification of this thin black line here, the mesorectal fascia, as well as the tumor's relationship between the, the mesorectal fascia. It extends from the pelvic floor all the way up to the rectosigmoid junction. So it guides our elective CTV superior and inferior extents for that reason. The Valentini and RTOG atlases are in agreement with how to, how to draw the structure. You want to make sure you stay, you know, you can capture all the fat space, all the nodal bearing tissue within that mesorectal fascia. And, and then, you know, this is a representation of the bottom slice at the pelvic floor where the levators insert. So the presacral nodes are also an important target. And the most common mistake I see with trainees is that often they won't take their presacral contour laterally enough. So you really want to make sure that the presacral space is covered all the way to that sacroiliac joint on both sides. So I see folks often like kind of cut it off at this corner of the psoas muscle here and omit this space back here. And personally, I have seen more than one patient recur in this area. It's a super painful morbid area to, to have a recurrence and can be very difficult to salvage if it invades the periosteum. So also we want to make sure we stay at least one centimeter in front of the sacral bone. I've, I've often also seen folks just be a little bit too small with their contours there and have the CTV contour hug the sacrum. So you want to make sure that you've got at least a centimeter of margin. Lastly, the lateral lymph nodes are a part of the elective nodal CTV. Um, and, you know, per the atlases and per my own practice, we want to make sure we've got seven millimeters of margin all the way around the internal iliac artery and vein, and also covering the strip of the obturator vessels along this obturator internus muscle. So with that, let's see if this works. This is how I contoured this case. Okay, so now we're going to contour this case, T3N0, mid-rectal adenocarcinoma, in a patient that's hoping to pursue organ preservation if they have a complete clinical response. So the first thing I'll do is I'll outline the GTV. I know from the MRI and the endoscopy report that this tumor starts five centimeters from the anal verge. And at the time of simulation, I placed this BB at the anal verge. So since these are 2.5 millimeter slices, we can count up. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. And this will be approximately first slice of my GTV. We know it is in about a five centimeter mass, so we can count up again. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Five, two, three, four. So this will be about the top slice of my GTV. And then looking down, you know, obviously we're gonna, the interpolation is not gonna be perfect for a segment this long. So the important thing to point out here is even though the tumor is semi-circumferential, I think you can see it well on this slice. Maybe this slice shows it well. The tumor is predominantly in the right bowel wall. You notice that from the endoscopy report also. 
even though the GTV is, you know, only semi-circumferential here, we are outlining the whole circumference of the bowel at the level of the GTV. This ensures that when we do our CTV expansion, we're getting adequate margin there. And also we're taking into account any day-to-day -day variations. We've got some stool here at the time of SIM that may not always be there. There may be gas, it may be completely empty. So putting the whole circumference of the rectum in your GTV ensures that your CTV is gonna be appropriate once you do that expansion. So that's about what it looks like. Let me show you what I actually drew. So here's the GTV as I, as I drew it for this patient. And the primary boost is gonna be a one centimeter expansion, which is, you know, volumetric expansion on the GTV to make sure that we have margin into the anterior structure. At, at this level, it's the prostate seminal vesicles. And that ensures that, it, again, if there's any day-to-day -day variation in bowel filling, bowel gas, that we've got enough margin there. So that's what my high-dose CTV is going to look like. And again, for this patient, you know, I, I did a little bit of a higher boost up to 54 because the patient was, was being treated per the OPER protocol and that allowed it. So at my institution, we use five millimeter PTV margin with daily KV and that's what that looks like. So here's the 54 gray volume. Next, what I want to show you is the elective nodal CTV. And for our standard T3N0 case, we're going to start our CTV where the common iliacs bifurcate into the internal and external. And I always find those the same way. So I go all the way up and identify the abdominal aorta way up here, and I follow it down. So now you see it has bifurcated into the left and the right common iliac arteries. We follow that down and about here, so you can see that common iliac artery bifurcated into the internal and external here on the left. And you will often see that it bifurcates a little bit sooner on one side rather than the other, and that's okay. I just include wherever it bifurcates first. So, so that's the superior aspect of our CTV, and that's going to make sure that we capture the internal iliac arteries adequately. The next thing that we you know, want to do when we're starting our top slice is we want to make sure we get the presacral space in front of the sacrum here. And we want to extend that presacral contour all the way to the sacroiliac joint. And that usually ends up being about the midpoint of the psoas muscle. We also want to make sure we get at least seven millimeters around the artery and vein. And I do that by setting my roller ball at 3.5 and just making sure at the radius at 3.5 so that the total diameter of this little circle is seven millimeters. So oh, there we go. Get out of the psoas there. All right, so that's what my top slice looks like. Take it to the SI joints there to get the presacral space, at least a centimeter in front of the sacrum and at least seven millimeters CTV around the internal iliac artery and vein. So let's go down then a little bit lower in the pelvis. Let's take this slice as an example. And we saw this in our practice question when we we're contouring the presacral space here. My personal practice is to go into the neuroforamen. That is a common site of recurrence for rectal adenocarcinoma. And so we want to make sure we have that adequately covered. We want to make sure we've got good coverage of the internal iliacs. And so that means the anterior border of our CTV is going to touch the posterior border of the external iliac artery or vein. So here again, I'm going into the foramen. I've got all this mesorectal fat around the rectum here. We're kind of just after the rectosigmoid junction. Here would be the rectosigmoid junction here. So on our slice that we're contouring, we're in the upper rectum. We want to make sure that we're at least one centimeter anterior from the mesorectum into whatever the structure is that's immediately anterior to it. So in this case, the bladder. So there we've got good margin on the anterior aspect of the mesorectum there. 
we've got the internal iliac vessels covered. Here's the external iliac artery. So we're just going to go to the posterior border of that. Remember, for a T3 tumor, we don't need to cover the externals. So all of that looks good. So then going a little bit lower down into the pelvis, maybe just above our Hydo CTV here. Again, we want to make sure we are getting good coverage of the presacral area. We keep our CTV out of the muscles of the pelvic sidewall and the bones of the pelvic sidewall. And here, again, we kind of want to come up and touch the back of the external iliac artery, get at least a centimeter into the bladder, curve around the muscles and bones of the pelvic sidewall. There we go. And in doing that, we've got the rectum covered, the mesorectal space, and good margin on the anterior mesorectum here. All right, so then down a little bit lower. Again, we want to touch the back or the front rather of the sacral bones. We want to make sure at this level that we're covering the obturator vessels along the obturator internus muscle. We'll go a centimeter into the posterior bladder. Again, along the obturator internus muscle here on the right. And then back around. Okay, so that's what it looks like here. Going down into the lower rectum, we're getting towards the pelvic floor. So in this case, we want to make sure we're covering our elective nodal CTV or our elective CTV at least a centimeter and a half below the last slice of the GTV. That's going to mimic that three centimeter to block edge back in the old days. So if this is the lowest slice of our GTV, you know, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four. So actually that puts us below the pelvic floor. So in this case, the last slice of G elective CTV is going to be right here at the bottom of the pelvic floor. You see how those muscles disappear. So right here will be our last slice. No need to go into this ischiorectal fossa with our CTV here. This is a pretty standard T3 tumor without any levator invasion. So this fat space isn't going to be at risk. Including this in the CTV is just going to throw more dose to the you know, posterior skin here or the bones and isn't really going to help us. So this will be the, the bottom slice of our elective CTV and kind of just keep that contour to within a millimeter or so of the, of the levator muscles per the atlases that we discussed. So that looks good. And so what that looks like, kind of cleaned up and interpolated, would be this. So here we've got our elective CTV in the tan and covering all those basins that we discussed. Again, at my institution, we use a five millimeter PTV margin with daily KV image guidance. And so that's what the final volume looks like there. So 40. All right. So that was that. I saw some of the questions in the chat and tried to answer them as we go along. Any other questions about case one that I didn't get to? Okay. So now let's do a, a post-operative case. I wanted to make sure we had time to cover this. Um, this is a guy, 33-year-old gentleman who presented with rectal pain. He had a five centimeter mass, two and a half centimeters from the verge. Biopsy showed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, microsatellite stable. His, his you know, staging workup appeared to show a clinical T2N0 semicircumferential tumor that was kind of invading the CRM, no EMVI. Because of this early stage, he went right to APR. And unfortunately, the pathology showed a large tumor ended up being pathologic T4B N0 with prostate invasion and a close margin at the radial aspect. So he was discussed in our tumor board. We started him with chemo, three months chemo, then chemo radiation, and then three more months of chemo to complete six months total. So the, the difference in this case is because of the pathologic T4B status, I did include coverage of the external iliacs. The other thing that's different is in the post-APR setting, I had generous coverage of the ischiorectal fossa or the, the area of the ischiorectal fossa. So maybe this gives this poll question away. What's the correct way to contour the post-operative elective CTB for a PT4B N0 rectal cancer? So 
we shouldn't even say correct way, but how would you do it? Sounds good. And it looks like the majority of you guys, 70% picked A, 8% picked B, 22% picked C, and no one picked D. So get out of here. I close this. All right. So I agree with you guys. I think the correct answer is A. And, you know, the reason for that, I kind of gave it away at the beginning. I elected to cover the external iliac nodal basin because of the pathologic T4B status. So, you know, that eliminates B and D as answer choices. This would be more standard coverage of the internal iliac ba basins. The difference between A and C is pretty subtle. You can see C carves the CTV contour out of these loops of small bowel. It's not surprising in the post-operative setting to see a lot more bowel in the pelvis in the vicinity of our fields. Like, like you guys chose, I will not carve my CTV volumes out of bowel in, in order to keep coverage of the, of the nodal basins around these vessels. So yeah, so here's how the atlases define the external iliac volumes. You essentially give that same set seven millimeter margin around the vessels, except you give a little bit more generous margin in the anterior lateral direction. Post-operative contouring, I will admit, I, I find tricky. And I do it a little bit differently in the post-LAR setting compared to the post-APR setting like we've got here. There aren't great atlases for the, for the post-op setting. You know, you can kind of look at some of the GYN atlases for some, for some you know, guidance or hints. But, you know, really what it comes down to is looking back at the older studies and the descriptions and figures that they put in for the post-operative 2D fields. And, you know, keeping in mind, really what we're doing is we're keeping in mind what basins we want to cover and we, we draw our CTV to include those. So I think it's easier to talk about it when we get to the actual case. So yeah, in the post-APR setting, I will include this ischiorectal fossa I talked about in the last case. I won't include my elective CTV to cover it in a standard, you know, pre-op setting. But in the post-APR setting, you know, this is all post-operative bed that's at risk. So I'll cover that with 45 gray. So let's look at this case. Okay, so let's take a look at our second case. Remember, this is a 33-year-old gentleman who had what was thought to be clinical T2 and 0 low rectal adenocarcinoma, underwent an upfront APR, but was found to have a pathologic T4B and 0 rectal adenocarcinoma with a, a close radial margin. So what we're doing here is looking at contouring in the post-APR setting, post-op. The first step in post-op contouring is to get your surgeon on the phone if you can, because it's really helpful, especially in the post-APR setting where you don't have an anastomosis to you know, delineate your target. It's really helpful to read the op note, look at the path report carefully, and if you can, talk to your surgeon. That's what I did in this case, and the surgeon helped me delineate the, the tumor bed, got it outlined in red. Um, the area of concern was really, you know, here at the, at the prostate and extending kind of posterior to those soft tissues. So this was the, the tumor bed that I delineated with the surgeon. The next thing I did was to create a CTV, a high-dose CTV. And so I like to have at least two centimeters of margin in the post-operative setting on either the anastomosis, if we're doing post-LAR treatment, or around the tumor bed, an area of concern for margin in the post-APR setting. So I start with a two centimeter expansion, and then what I do is make sure that we have good inferior coverage of the ischiorectal fossa and, and the perineal soft tissues. So I've kind of modified it here a little bit manually to make sure that we've got the coccyx and all of the, the fat space there in the ischiorectal fossa. It was not a target in our standard pre-op fields. Remember, it's not a target unless your tumor is invading the levators or going through the levators. But in the post-APR setting, it is a target. In fact, some people will, will actually put a wire on the perineal scar at the time of simulation to help guide their, their volumes. So, so I didn't do that in this case, but that's definitely an option. Then for my high dose PTV, that's a five millimeter expansion. So you can see that here. And for me, this is gonna be my 54 gray volume. 
I elected to boost to 54 gray rather than 50.4 because in the post APR setting, we really don't have very much small bowel in the field. If this were the post LAR setting and we were you know, treating the anastomosis with a lot of bowel around it, I would probably limit my boost dose to 50.4. So now that that's done, I wanna show you the elective, oops, I wanna show you the elective CTV. There you go. Let's demo that and contour it together. So I'll use the same landmarks to start my elective nodal CTV. For me, I just, I always like to start with the abdominal aorta to, to stay oriented. I follow that down past the bifurcation and to the left and the right common iliac arteries. We've seen this before. And then we follow those down until we see, there we go, the common iliac arteries split, see right there, into internal and external. So right at the bifurcation is going to be my first slice of elective nodal CTV. So again, just like before, we want to get you know, good coverage of the presacral space. That means going down to the SI joint or about you know, the, the midpoint of the psoas muscle. We're going to get seven millimeters of margin around the vessels and a centimeter of margin in front of the sacrum to adequately cover that presacral space. We do the same on the other side, the SI joint here. All right, so that's what the elective nodal CTV is going to look like at this level. The common mistake I see again is to hug the vessels a little bit too tightly, not give enough margin posteriorly here or anteriorly in front of the sacrum. So lower down, let's maybe let's maybe look here. So in that first case, we were only covering the internal iliac nodal basin. In this case, because we had pathologic T4B disease, we're also going to cover the external iliac nodes. So here we're going to cover the internal iliac nodes and also go a little bit more anterior to cover the external iliac artery and vein with at least seven millimeters of margin. Again, stay one centimeter in front of the sacrum. And we'll do the same here on the other side. Using that roller ball with a diameter set to seven to make sure we've got seven millimeters around the vessels. We'll go all the way back here and a centimeter in front of the sacrum. All right, so that's what it looks like there. We'll go a little bit lower in the pelvis. Here's a good slice. We're starting to see some of those post-operative changes, post-APR. Keep the CTV out of the muscles and the bones. Because of the T4B status, we will cover the external iliac nodal basin. And you'll probably notice I'm giving a little bit more than seven millimeters of margin in the anterior lateral direction. Most of the atlases will recommend being more generous in that direction. So I've done that there. Back to the sacrum. And here, you know, again, we're, we've got post APR anatomy. So, you know, in the native pelvis, we would see the rectum here, the mesorectum. We'd want to cover the whole mesorectum, include some posterior bladder to get this whole space covered. But, you know, an APR is a total mesorectal excision. So the mesorectum is gone, the mesorectal nodes are gone. We can, can keep our target volume a little bit more tightly curved around the vessels in the presacral space in the post-APR setting. If we were in the post-LAR setting and we had an anastomosis here that we needed to cover, our volumes would look a little bit more like our standard mesorectal coverage. So now we're getting a little bit lower in the pelvis. We're getting towards the area of the tumor bed. So here we wanna cover the obturator nodal basin here along this obturator internus muscle. Again, we wanna give margin along the external artery and vein and about a centimeter in front of that, centimeter or two in front of that tumor bed. Here we go with external coverage on the other side, obturator coverage on the other side, and then staying out of the muscles of the pelvic sidewall. So there we go. Going down a little bit lower. The next question is where to stop the inguinal coverage. So here we're you know, at the level of the, the femoral heads. And so here we'd still cover the obturators and the externals. 
here we would go a centimeter or so into the posterior bladder. Curve around in front of the sacrum. So there we'd still have external iliac coverage, again, being a little bit more generous in the anterior lateral direction. More than that standard seven millimeters. There we go. And here we've got to, to the roof of the acetabulum. So this is a landmark, kind of where the bony acetabulum reaches this corner is where I'll stop if I'm, if I'm just aiming to cover the external iliacs. So this for me would be the inguinal nodal basin. And for this patient, you know, we wouldn't need to cover that. There was no anal canal invasion for this, this tumor. So here, the elective CTV kind of goes down like this to cover the obturator nodal basin, again, to the, to the back of the bladder here at this level of the tumor bed and so forth. So that's what that would look like. And then the elective CTV can kind of mirror, mirror the tumor bed. Again, if we had placed a perineal scar, we could have ensured that our CTV 45 covered that perineal scar. There's no need to boost the scar. So let me turn this off and I'll show you the final product. So we've got down below, you know, we made sure we covered the perineum with the elective dose, the 45 gray dose. And then we've got it going up here to cover the external iliacs. And then, you know, for me, I've got a five millimeter PTV and, and that's what that looks like here. So that is our post-operative case. All right. Sorry, I'm answering this one last question in the chat. In terms of avoidance structure or a constraint on the colostomy bag, I'll admit it hasn't come up too often. Usually our surgeons will, will take care to place the colostomy a little bit higher. But, you know, if, if it were in the field, I would try to keep hotspots over 45 gray out, out of that ostomy. So if you think it's going to be close, definitely a good idea to contour it. Okay, so in our last few minutes, here's a post-operative case variation for a patient who had an LAR instead of an APR. And so this is the case where we will, you know, contour the area of the anastomosis. You can see the surgical clips here that, that help guide that. And the target is going to go, you know, at least a centimeter, center, centimeter and a half, you know, even two centimeters in front of that. And rather than covering that whole issue of rectal fossa down to the, to the skin, we'd stop the elective coverage at the pelvic floor, similar to what we did in the preoperative case. So we don't have time to go all the way through case three, but I'll just present it to you briefly. This is a young woman who had a very low rectal tumor that invaded into the anal canal really nasty, nasty looking tumor endoscopically, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, MR, T4B, N2B, pretty much with all of the bad risk factors. It invaded the posterior vagina, it invaded the circumferential resection margin, EMVI, lateral lymph nodes, perirectal nodes, pretty much everything. So we treated her with some induction chemo, actually triplet per the Prodige trial. And after that, she had a nice response to her, to her induction chemo. So we consolidated her with long course chemo radiation with the plan to do surgery. So this is the last Zoom poll. Is there any way that y'all would adjust the, the target coverage based on the, the factors of this case, T4B and 2B with anal canal involvement? So again, pink is GTV, green is bladder, and the different colors here indicate the different options. All right, very good. So it looks like the majority of you guys chose answer choice D, 69%. And that is at least what I think is the correct answer. So this is a little bit controversial. You know, there, there are some retrospective papers out there, one actually from MD Anderson and another one from a, a South Korean group that showed if there are no gross inguinal, inguinal nodes and you just have a low rectal tumor with a little bit of anal canal involvement, if you don't cover the groins electively, your chance of isolated groin failure is only about 4%. So there are some radonks who would be very reasonable to say, if the baseline risk is only 4%, why are you going to add the morbidity of adding elective groin coverage? You know, how much are you really going to bring that down? I think the flip side of that coin is, you know, next week we'll talk about anal cancer. 
obviously for, for anal cancer, you know, squamous, squamous cell carcinoma is arising from the anal canal. The, the inguinal lymph nodes are our primary echelon drainage, and we certainly cover them in that setting. So I would argue, why would we think adenocarcinomas in the, in the anal canal itself would behave any differently? I also think, you know, I don't, I don't use a lot of IMRT or VMAT for rectal cancer, but I will use IMRT or VMAT when, when I'm covering the groins, because I think, you know, if, when you use that, that technique, you don't really increase the morbidity of treatment very much by, by adding the groin coverage. So this is, this is what I would, this is what I would do, what I did do. So I know we're at the top of the hour. I don't want to belabor much more. This is a good resource for, for inguinal contour. And you may have even seen this already in some of your GYN, your GYN resources here through this. So, so that's that. And you can see, I don't know if you noticed, this is a patient I treated supine. And you might see this structure here at the vaginal, at the vaginal apex. This is a vaginal dilator. And I'll talk a little bit more about this next week when we talk about anal canal treatment planning. But when I treat young women, really any, any woman who expresses interest in preserving a sexual function, I will use a vaginal dilator, a kind of spacer at the time of SIM and every day during treatment in order to displace the anterior vaginal wall. So that's why this looks a little bit different. You can't use a vaginal dilator in the supine position, in the prone position. So patients that I'm going to use this treatment technique, I will sim and treat supine. So I want to respect everybody's time. So I will end it there and take any questions. Oh, this is a good one. I love this topic. For T3 to T4 or N1 disease, uh, which cases do you consider omitting radiation? And are you talking about pre-op or post-op here? Pre-op. Yeah, so there's a there's a study that finished accruing recently here, the prospect study, and the eligibility there was T2, T3, N0, N1. And you know, for those patients, they were randomized either to pre-op chemo alone before surgery or or the standard pre-op chemo radiation. And so, you know, that that study has finished accrual. We're waiting for it to mature. It hasn't been published. But my suspicion is in the US. Uh, there, there are a lot of folks that probably get radiation for these kind of low to mid risk locally advanced rectal cancers that maybe don't get as much benefit for it from it. So our group will discuss everybody in tumor in tumor board, but sometimes these you know T2, T3, N0 to N1 patients, especially if they're high, like mid to high rectum, our our thought is they probably don't have a very high baseline risk of local recurrence. With, with surgery alone or surgery and chemo, and radiation just adds kind of additional toxicity and morbidity to their treatment. That said, our, our U.S. guidelines still recommend preoperative treatment for everybody, T3, T4, and or node positive, as long as they're, you know, within, within the rectum. So our center tends to be a little bit more liberal about omission of radiation. I would say for for T4 tumors, those are at pretty high, higher than, than average risk for local recurrence. So we usually won't advocate for omission of radiation for a T4 tumor, but we, but we will consider it for, you know, for lower risk T3 tumors, especially if the margins are widely clear. If our experienced surgeons look at the MRI and think they're not going to have an issue clearing the radial margins, occasionally we'll discuss omission, but it's a controversial topic in the U.S. right now. Um, one other question, the caudal end of the tumor is different between the colonoscopy and MRI. Which one do you use? Great question. This happens all the time, right? And for me, I choose whatever's going to make the volume biggest. So if the, whichever shows the, lo the lowest volume that's recorded on either endoscopy or physical exam or imaging, I'll use that as the inferior border. It's the, you know, the, the worst thing we could do is miss giving the, the right dose to the highest risk area and increasing the 50 gray or the 45 gray volume or both isn't really going to make that much difference in, in terms of toxicity. So I always err on the side of being a little bit more generous in the target volume delineation. And one more question came in. If positive pelvic node, do you boost that node? And does it depend on whether the surgeon will do lateral pel pelvic lymphadenectomy? Great question. And, and our, our surgeons kind of follow the, the, the Japanese approach to lateric pel lateral pelvic lymph node dissections in that they tend to be a little bit more aggressive. 
if the lateral pelvic nodes are bigger than, you know, six, seven millimeters after preoperative treatment, our surgeons will, will do a, a lateral lymph node dissection. So that being the practice, we, we don't typically boost them to, to a higher dose because our surgeons will, will address that surgically. I think, what would I do if I, if I weren't practicing with surgeons who had that approach? It, it would be tempting, you know, we, it comes up sometimes for patients with positive inguinal nodes, you know, should we give it a higher boost? Because boosting in the groins is something that's definitely done for anal squamous cell carcinoma or for gynecologic cancers. So often we will, we will take that approach, kind of a standard pelvic treatment with preoperative intent, but giving a higher boost, you know, to, to the tissue tolerance, you know, in the GYN malignancies, you can take that 60 gray plus in hopes of sparing the patient a groin dissection, just with the knowledge that adding a groin dissection to an APR or to an LAR, you know, makes the the recovery a a lot, lot more difficult. So yeah, definitely a a tough question that we'll discuss in our tumor boards. Yes. Great question about brachytherapy boost. We don't, it's not, it's not historically been part of our practice to do endoluminal brachytherapy. In the U.S., Hopkins had a had a brief experience with that. I know a lot of the European centers, the Opera Opera trial, is you know they've they've resulted some of their reported some of their results at that ASCO meetings in the last couple of years. Really great organ preservation rates around eighty percent for early stage small tumors with an endoluminal brachy boost. But it's it's not something that we're we're doing currently, kind of based on history. So. Definitely, I love to read about it though, and and maybe one day we'll move in that direction. Mm. Ah, yeah, pre-op short course. So we do a lot of short course radiation. I didn't get into it in in this talk because we were supposed to be talking about contouring and my contours are the same, whether I'm treating with short course or long course. Our center, although we don't do a lot of endoluminal brachytherapy, we do a lot of, of intraoperative brachytherapy, HDR brachytherapy with, you know, with ham applicator channels. So usually it's not a surprise when someone's going to have a positive margin. Usually it's presacral or along the pelvic sidewall. And so our tumor board will, will discuss all these cases pre-op and have intraoperative radiation therapy available, kind of on call to the OR if there's concern for a positive margin. So we will do either 10 gray, 12 and a half gray, occasionally 15 gray uh, with an HDR brachy boost in the operating room. That's our practice. I think external beam boosts after surgery, after they've healed, all of that gets really tricky. And the anatomy post-op in terms of the bowel is just so horrible to, to try to plan any, any sort of boost after the fact with external beam. So I don't, I don't personally do that. Re-irradiation, another great question. MD Anderson has a long history of doing hyperfractionated, somewhat accelerated re-irradiation. And we've published on this. My boss, Program Das, is, has been an author on a lot of these papers. And our regimen is 39 gray in 1.5 gray fractions twice daily with a six-hour interfraction interval. And we will do that either in the preoperative setting, like for someone who's going to get a repeat operation, or if the patient's non-surgical, the recurrence is non-operable, we'll, we'll do that kind of in the standalone definitive setting. And we've shown that it's, it's safe and well-tolerated in both. Yes. So I also will use IMRT in post-operative cases. Great question. I wasn't explicit about that in this case, but absolutely. In the, in the post-op setting, I think IMRT helps you a lot to carve out that anterior bowel containing segment of the pelvis. So I agree. I don't use a lot of IMRT pre-op, but I use a a fair, you know, almost exclusively IMRT post-op. 